coming up on the News at 5. Well, we've been very fortunate here in Belt to have trucks that have heated pumps. Freezing temperatures are here to stay for now. How firefighters face the cold while battling the flames. Plus... I'm Mike Dennison in Helena. Right to work bills are coming before the legislature. We'll tell you what's at stake. From Montana's news leader, this is MTN News at 5. Good afternoon and welcome to the News at 5. I'm Marian Davidson. Thanks for joining us. Well, one snowmobiler is dead after an avalanche in the Swan Mountain Range. According to the Flathead Avalanche Center, the slide was triggered in Wounded Buck Creek Saturday afternoon. Five riders were caught, four were partially buried, and one was killed. Dangerous avalanche conditions prevented rescuers from reaching the scene until yesterday. And now to tell us more about that nasty weather out there, here is Andy Curtis filling in for Curtis Grevenitz. Yeah, that's right, it's bad out there and it's not going to get any better anytime soon. Taking a look at the wind chill, dangerous temperatures, 26 below with that wind chill in Great Falls, 31 with the wind chill in uh, Cup Bank, Haver 26, 19 in Helena. So that's not the exact temperature on the thermometer, but it is what it feels like out there. So very cold and not a big change from yesterday. So I guess we're used to it. Yesterday was a cold one. Today's a cold one. Tomorrow will be cold as well. Three degrees cooler in Great Falls, two degrees cooler in Helena, so not a big jump there. But hey, look, heat wave down there in the mining city and uh, south in Dillon, five and seven degrees warmer right now than they were yesterday. And you probably notice a little bit of snow, just a little bit dusting the air, making uh, things fairly overcast uh, across the state. That's starting to taper off now, really won't be a problem tonight at Into Tomorrow. But the big issue, and this isn't a surprise, is that temperature. It's cold. It's going to get colder and we better get used to it. I'll tell you how long this will last coming up in the full forecast. All right. Thanks, Andy. I don't know if we can ever get used to temperatures that cold and with weather that's this cold. A lot of us are trying to stay inside, but for some people like firefighters, work means they have to be outside. MTN's Coulter Anstat reports. Monday morning, Belt firefighters were called to a home for a report of a fire. It was cause from trying to defrost frozen pipes. Uh, they used too large of a heating device. Insulation under the home and the skirting around the home caught fire. Well, we've been very fortunate here in Belt to have trucks that have heated pumps. That's our biggest thing is pumps freeze up before we even get to a scene. The fire department was also fortunate the fire was close to the station, further reducing the possibility of pumps potentially freezing up. Belt Fire Chief Travis Johnson says other departments called in to help may not have been so lucky. We did have some mutual aid units coming from San Cooley and Malmstrom, and we were able to cancel them in plenty of time, so hopefully they don't have any damage. He says firefighters try to rotate as much as possible and use mutual aid in the extreme cold so firefighters can take breaks and warm up. In Belt, Coulter Anstat, MTN News. Well, it can also be hard to get out of the cold if you do not have a home. As frigid temperatures arrived in the Helena area, the local emergency shelter saw a big jump in people needing its services. Leaders at God's Love say they had 14 new clients asked to move in over the weekend, and they got more requests, seven more requests, just this morning. Now, in order to maintain social distancing during the pandemic, the shelter has already had to cut back from 31 available beds for men to 25. Despite that, leaders say they have not had as many people in overflow space as they did last winter. They credit that to housing assistance and other COVID-19 support programs. Currently, God's Love has 16 people staying in overflow areas. So it's um, a little bit easier right now to give people the six foot distancing. Um, but you know what we're going to be facing is, OK, what other parts of the building can we put people that will allow for the six foot distancing? God's Love leaders say their biggest needs right now are socks, gloves, scarves, and other winter items. They also need bleach, disinfectant, and other cleaning supplies because they are cleaning much more frequently due to COVID-19. Now taking a look at the state's COVID-19 situation, Montana reported just over 200 more COVID-19 cases today, while active cases in the state continue to fall. Right now, there are about 3,100 active cases, and to put that number in perspective for you, that is less than a fifth of the peak active case numbers from November. 101 people are currently hospitalized with the virus in the state. Two additional deaths have been reported today, which brings the statewide death total to 1,329. 
MTN uses a combination of state and local data to report COVID-19 cases and deaths in the state. And as of today, more than 140,000 total doses of the COVID-19 vaccine have been distributed in Montana. And more than 38,000 Montanans have been fully immunized. The state also releases county level vaccine numbers every Monday. So in Lewis and Clark County, 10,700 doses have been administered and just over 3,000 people fully immunized. Numbers are similar in Cascade County with around 10,700 doses given and approximately 2,800 people fully vaccinated. Next week, the legislature is scheduled to hear a bill that would turn Montana into a right to work state, a move bitterly opposed by labor unions. But as MTN's Mike Dennison reports, it is just one of several bills before the legislature that would make it harder for unions to collect dues or fees from members and non-members alike. First, let's talk about the term right to work and what it means. Essentially, most right to work laws say any union that bargains a contract for a group of workers cannot charge any dues or fees to workers within that group who don't want to join the union. Representative Caleb Hinkle of Belgrade, a Republican, is sponsoring the main right to work bill, which is scheduled for its first hearing next week. I don't view it as anti-union at all. Um, no union that provides legitimate benefits should have to fear workers having a choice on whether to take those benefits unless that member wants to join that union and pay those fees. All this does is give them that choice. At least two other related measures making it harder for labor unions to collect dues from workers also are before the session. One of them, Senate Bill 89, would prohibit any government employer from allowing a payroll checkoff to collect dues from union members. The sponsor, Republican Senator Keith Regeer of Kalispell, says the government shouldn't be involved in collecting dues for groups actively involved in partisan politics. But union reps say dues money does not support a union's political activity, and that government employers allow all kinds of payroll checkoffs. It's amazing to me that uh, it's still okay for the state government and public em uh, you know, employers to collect contributions to the National Rifle Association, but they're going to say it's not appropriate for a worker to be able to sign an agreement and have their dues deducted and sent to their union. Union officials also say the right to work bill is clearly meant to undermine organized labor by allowing workers to benefit from union contracts but not support the union financially. That's not a good thing for the state, they say. Success of unions and the size of unions historically in every economic measure goes hand in hand with the success and the size of the middle class. Hinkle says companies want to relocate or expand in right to work states, meaning better economic outcomes for Montana in the future. In the past, bills like these have failed in Montana, but with big Republican majorities and a GOP governor, supporters hope the politics are different this time around. Curtis, the president of Montana's largest union, says she'd like to know what Governor Gianforte thinks of these efforts. Whenever we've asked the governor about right to work, he said only that it's not one of his priorities for now. Reporting from Helena, Mike Dennison, MTN News. None of these bills have had a debate or vote yet on either the floor of the House or the Senate. And supporters and opponents of right to work laws often present dueling studies showing the alleged impact of wages and business activity in states with or without such laws. MTN News got an early look at a unique study just released this week. It comes from a research group that tends to support organized labor and refers specifically to Montana. The study by the Illinois Economic Policy Institute did not look just at wages or economic growth. It examined 20 different factors over a period of eight years that measured the overall quality of life and civic engagement in both right to work and non right to work states. The study found, as a group, right-to-work states scored lower in every category on everything from life expectancy to poverty rates to consumer debt. It also said Montana fared better than right-to-work states in 15 of the 20 categories. Representative Caleb Hinkle of Belgrade, who is sponsoring a bill to enact right-to-work laws in Montana, says he has seen multiple studies that show they lead to higher wages and more jobs. But a co-author of the Illinois study told MTN News it also shows that frontline workers during the pandemic fare particularly better in states with strong union representation. Unless the lawmakers in Montana think that teachers, 
police officers, firefighters, and nurses are overpaid, we should be seeking out ways to support these frontline workers, while the evidence, of course, suggests that right-to-work laws have the opposite effect. Hinkle's House Bill 251 is scheduled for its first hearing on February 16th before the House Business and Labor Committee. And when we come back, Andy Curtis will have a complete check of your forecast in storm tracker weather and later, the latest from Washington on the eve of the historic second impeachment trial of Donald Trump. Welcome back, everybody. Andy Curtis filling in for Curtis Grevenance tonight. And man, oh man, is it cold out there. And it looks cold on top of Mac Pass. I don't need to say this because I'm sure you've already experienced it, but the roads are nasty pretty much everywhere, at least everywhere that I've been driving. So give yourself plenty of time, especially if you're going up over any of the passes. Give yourself plenty of time. Here's a very accurate look at the capital city right now. <laughs> Obviously, our camera's been frozen over, but the whole city and the whole state's been frozen over, so not too far off here. Three below is what the temperature is on the thermometer, but it sure don't feel like that. 19 below with that wind chill factor, and it's not even that windy out, but uh, it's windy enough to make things very, very cold, and that temperature's only going to get worse as we get farther into tonight. 11 degrees on the thermometer around the Electric City, feels like 26 below, uh, 11 degrees below, I should say. Don't think you uh, made a mistake there. I know what I'm doing. 26 below is what it feels like with that wind chill. It is downright bone chilling across the entire state. 12 below in Haver, 17 below in Cup Bank. Look at that though, west side of the state, downright balmy. 22 degrees in Missoula, 9 in Kalispell, Butte 19, Dillon is 7. And again, these temperatures uh, aren't factoring in the wind chill. So of course it is colder than that across Montana tonight, and it's not really going to get any better. Uh, sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but we're going to be looking at temperatures very similar to this and even a little bit colder as we head farther into the week and closer to the weekend. We got some winter weather alerts and advisories, wind chill, wind chill, winter weather, winter storm warning pretty much across the entire state with a few exceptions. What we were seeing on the west side of the state and down in the southwest portion of Montana where the temperatures are a little bit warmer, but still don't uh, be fooled. It's still dangerous out in these spots, even with some snow starting to light up. Uh, it was just a slight dusting across the, the Helena area today, and that's starting to taper off out to the west up in the mountains. It's still coming down just a little bit, but the snow for the most part will be stopping as we head into tonight and to tomorrow. There'll be a few dust ups here and there, but for the most part up high, few pockets, and really it's the cold. It's the cold combined with that wind that we have to pay attention to more than the snow over the next couple of days. So seven day look at the Great Falls area, eight below for the high tomorrow, nine below for the high on Wednesday, 14 below for the high on Thursday, and then it starts to warm up to four below on Friday as we head into the weekend. And then this Saturday, yeah, I hope you didn't pack away that uh, swimsuit because one degree and six degrees on Saturday and Sunday. Not a lot of sunshine. You can see pretty overcast with a few snow flurries, mostly a slight 20% chance here in the Helena area on Thursday in the evening, and then that's going to carry over into Friday. But again, very slight. Doesn't look like uh, doesn't look like it's going to be anything compared to what we saw this past weekend, but those temperatures, and it's warm here in the Helena area. Six degrees tomorrow, two degrees on Wednesday before we get to below zero and zero heading into the weekend. So bottom line, very cold. It's going to stay very cold, at least through the rest of this week and into the weekend. So be careful and just be safe and be smart. All right, thanks, Andy. Well, on the eve of the historic second impeachment trial of Donald Trump, Democrats and even some Republicans are debating how thorough the presentation should be. The proceedings are almost certain to end in acquittal, and many are eager to finish the task as quickly as possible and move forward. Alice Barr has the latest from Washington. One day before the second impeachment trial of former President Trump begins, his attorneys forcefully denying he incited the deadly attack against the U.S. Capitol and blasting the case as, quote, political theater. They argue it's unconstitutional to try a president after he's left office. Senators will vote first on that question tomorrow, but the Democratic majority has the votes to move the trial ahead. When something as horrible, as dastardly, 
that happened on January 6th occurs, you cannot sweep it under the rug. Starting on Wednesday, each side will have 16 hours to make its case. House impeachment managers arguing the former president launched a campaign of lies to try to reverse the 2020 election, culminating in a fiery speech directly before the riot, when they allege he aimed the mob, quote, like a loaded cannon down Pennsylvania Avenue. They're calling it the most grievous constitutional crime ever committed by a president. The Trump legal team denies he incited the mob, claims his comments were protected free speech, and accuses Democrats of trying to, quote, harness the chaos of the moment for their own political gain. Republicans confident the former president will ultimately be acquitted. It's not a question of how the trial ends. It's a question of when it ends. Democrats acknowledge a conviction is unlikely and are still debating whether to call witnesses or stick with a streamlined process to move beyond a dark chapter and refocus on the needs of the nation. In Washington, Alice Barr, NBC News. NBC News will provide updates throughout the day here on KTVH, but you can also watch uninterrupted coverage from Court TV all day tomorrow on the KTVH streaming app beginning at 11 a.m. To learn more about the KTVH streaming app, visit ktvh.com slash streaming. And coming up next on the News at 5, more on an after-school program that has become an escape during the pandemic for high schoolers. News Leader, you're watching MTN News at 5. Welcome back to the News at 5. The Paris Gibson Square Museum of Art has an after-school program for teens. Now, for the participants, it is more than just a chance to learn about art. It is also a needed social outlet. MTN's Cassandra Soto has the story. The Curative Art Collective is a free program for teens inspired by the arts. It's pretty therapeutic. I enjoy it. It's nice to sit down and just be able to get tuned into that. Every Tuesday evening, young adults meet at the Paris Gibson Square Museum of Art to sit down for a meal, work on their craft, and create an environment for open conversation about art. Sierra Lane has attended CAC meetings for over a year since the program start. Now in the pandemic, she says she looks forward to every Tuesday she spends with her peers. You know, everybody's talking about the COVID and everything, but it, I mean, it affects everybody just because you don't get to socialize as much as you'd like. So being out here and actually being able to have mature conversation feels refreshing. So it's, it's nice to be able to sit down and, and be with people that are just the same but different. Students receive guidance from artists working in the industry today. Executive Director Sarah Justice says providing her insights to young adults as a multimedia artist is her passion. And I saw a need in Great Falls when I came here as the Education Director. Um, I wanted to, to run a program for teenagers, a place where they can have an artistic outlet that's safe, consistent, um, and provides art supplies. You do not have to profess to be a good artist. <laughs> you just come and explore. For student artist Caden Hill, the group is a place where he can escape and be his authentic self. As a teenager, it's really easy to feel alone or like you don't have any friends and stuff like that, especially in today's climate with social media and stuff. So basically it lets you like kind of unite with like-minded individuals that you could have a good time with. In Great Falls, Cassandra Soto, MTN News. All right, and we will wrap things up here on the News at 5 when we come back. But first, here is Lester Holt with a look at what is coming up on Nightly News. When we welcome our West Coast viewers, we'll tell you why an early tax filing season could work to your advantage. What you should know. Also, her journey from a Russian orphanage to becoming an American Paralympian was featured in a touching Super Bowl ad. Tonight, my conversation with Jessica Long. News Leader. You're watching MTN News at 5. All right, welcome back to the News at 5. You have heard or probably even experienced keys, crumbs, wallets, phones, other things getting wedged in the crevices of your car. But what about a snake? Well, this pet boa constrictor, yep, a boa constrictor, got stuck in the dashboard of his owner's car after a visit to the vet. Stanley County Animal Protective Services in North Carolina had to come help him wriggle free. The snake was safely removed and is now back home nice and happy, but it is unclear how a five foot long boa constrictor wedged itself in such a tight space. 
What a mystery. Ain't no mystery to these temperatures, though. Cold for the rest of the week in Helena. Dangerously co cold. Below zero temperatures tonight and for a high on Thursday. Single digits for the rest of the week. And we're warm in Helena. Great Falls. Eight below tomorrow, nine below on Wednesday, 14 below for the high on Thursday, and 25, 30 degree below temperatures at night. So it's a cold one, folks. Well, thanks for making us part of your evening. NBC Nightly News is next.